Friends, welcome to our first wildcard matchup. As will be the case with many of these sport-related wildcard matchups, today's will be less interesting or deep than the last and more of a cut to the chase regarding which game plays better. That being said, I also want to level with everyone here that I have never been very good at baseball in real life nor baseball video games in general, but I know a crappy game when I see one. That being said, I genuinely did not have any fun with either of these games, but fear not, I think gamers and avid baseball fans will both be able to agree with the outcome of this one as it's unfortunately another no contest. I won't spoil it just yet, but for anyone that has played both games or has seen or read reviews for either prior to this, you probably know where this is going. Before we get started, please feel free to like and subscribe here and help grow our channel. We have a long way to go with the great N64 showdown, and any and all support along the way is always appreciated. So let's go ahead and get started with Triple Play 2000 for N64. Published by EA Sports and developed by a combination of EA Canada and Treyarch. Various websites seem to only credit one or the other, while the manual for the N64 version of the game credits both. Released for PS1, N64, and Windows, the N64 version seemed to be a marriage of various features of the PS1 release of the 1999 and 2000 editions of the games, versus the full package of the latest and greatest entry in the series. The series ran on a multitude of platforms from Triple Play 96, released in 1995 on the Sega Genesis, up to Triple Play 2002, released in 2002 for Xbox and PS2. With six entries released during the N64's life cycle, this is the only entry in the series which ever came to the N64. Now we are not here to compare this game, which is by all means a port of a PS1 game versus a version of the game that can stand on its own, but I thought that information was worthy of being included in order to put into perspective the fact that this is the only entry that EA made any effort to put on the 64, and it is unfortunately very telling. So without further ado, the 129th entry in the North American Library, released on March 22nd, 1999, almost a full month after its PS1 counterpart, and was not released in Japan nor the PAL region. Official reviews of just the N64 version, apart from the PS1 and PC releases, are difficult to find, but the reviews I found, aside from a 78 from Nintendo Power, were all very negative. Let's start with the visuals. The player models are detailed enough for 1999 with the arguable bare minimum hints of varying facial hair, skin tones, and so on. The running, pitching, batting, and throwing animations are fluid enough, and while I'm not an expert on late 90s baseball video games by any means, I think these models and animations are at least slightly above average of the time. Knowing when the game was made at least, it doesn't leave you wanting too much more out of it. Obviously, they haven't aged all that well, but I think they definitely would have been satisfying for the time. While I can't verify if these are true to the players of the time, they even go so far as to have some unique batting stances here and there. I'm not necessarily saying they are true to each player, but they at least offer some variety per player. The only drawback I can say from the animations is the opening of a given game and subsequent inning changes just looks silly with the players taking the field at lightning speed and materializing from the ground far away from the dugout. It's almost like they map the animations out to the dimensions of a particular field, maybe Wrigley given Sammy Sosa as the player on the cover, but these clearly weren't made to match each and every ballpark's dimensions. One additional note on the players' models is a small glitch where I noticed I had back-to-back -back batters wearing the same jersey number. It only happened once, but I thought it was worth pointing out. Now the fields and the stadiums are not necessarily anything to write home about, but they also weren't anything to complain about. The color palette is a little washed out, but I think the details of the fields and the stadiums are acceptable, again, for the time. Outside of the low quality stretch texture used to cover the stands, most of your major landmarks are here from the Kauffman Stadium Jumbotron to the Big Green Monster at Fenway Park. Now not necessarily related to the topic at hand, it's always fun to go back to these old sports games and see older venues no longer in use and even franchises that have moved on in city and or mascot, like the Montreal Expos or Old Yankee Stadium. Now the gameplay aspect is pretty straightforward to discuss since most baseball games have the same fundamental common denominators as far as function and button inputs. But Triple Play is unfortunately slimmer on both of these compared to its counterparts in All-Star Baseball and Ken Griffey Jr.'s Slugfest. When pitching, you use the C buttons to select your pitch, then you can pitch either in or out of the strike zone using A or B respectively. There are of course options like intentional walks and pickoff throws, but the main aspect here is the after touch after you throw using the analog stick to try to place your pitch more precisely. 
And I think this is truly where the absence of a visual strike zone and ball placement take away from the gameplay rather than make the experience more immersive. It works and is fairly responsive how you would expect, but I think it would be better in at least a single player situation if the strike zone were on screen. Matting is made equally more difficult in this scenario, but I find the aspect less offensive as connoisseurs of this genre may argue that it's easier to see the ball without the visual distraction of the strike zone display. And I certainly couldn't argue with them. But the fact remains that the better baseball games on this platform have this feature on both sides of the ball, at least for single player, while triple play does not. The visual display of the strike zone and the reticle therein, especially with the often unreliable sensitivity of the N64's analog stick, would go a long way in providing tangible feedback to the player as to why they missed the throw or the swing. As far as fielding goes, the only complaint I have here is basically the frame rate tanks when there's a hit and it makes fielding extremely difficult without the field assist on. By the time the game catches up to where the ball is landing, you've lost precious time to figure out which fielder you have control of and which direction to head to the catch reticle. Modern games snap to the catch reticle much quicker and this is one aspect of the game that certainly has not aged well. So if you're playing this for the first time, I recommend leaving the field assist on. The sound quality of the game is definitely a highlight here. The voiceover quality is unbelievable for the N64 and seems a lot more fluid compared to some sports games spliced voice clips that can be off-putting with the tone or the calling of a particular play and then mentioning a specific player's name as they can often have a dramatic contrast in tone. The sounds of the crowd are on a pretty short loop, but again the quality is surprisingly high. You even have walk-up music for each batter. While I can't necessarily vet how many different clips there are for each batter, the reduced quality is great at representing the echo of the song playing over the PA system in the stadium. And last but not least, for the sound department, the sound of a hit sounds like a hit. You can hear the crack of the bat, you can hear the subsequent throw and catch, and lastly the umpire and commentator on the call. I won't go so far as to say the audio is the best part of the game because the gameplay is really serviceable overall, but the quality of the sounds is a really surprising highlight I was not expecting when I turned this on for the first time. Overall I think this game has slightly above average visuals with the models and in-game animations, below average visuals with the terrible looking crowd textures and lightning fast speed which teams take the field with at the start of a game or an inning. Average gameplay and mechanics compared to the previously mentioned All-Star series and Ken Griffey Jr. And the lastly, the audio is definitely above average. It's not the best baseball option on the N64, but it's certainly not the worst. So let's go ahead and talk about the worst. I hate to give it away so quickly, and I apologize if anyone watching has fond memories of playing this game with friends and family back in the day, but Mike Piazza's Strike Zone is a bad N64 game and an even worse baseball game. Developed by Devil's Thumb Entertainment, a spin-off of a few employees from DMA Design led by Tony Harmon, and if that doesn't mean anything to you, DMA Design later became Rockstar North after being acquired by the Hauser Brothers Rockstar Games. So it's equally sad and interesting that a group of DMA employees split off from what went on to be one of the most renowned and innovative studios gaming will ever know. Not to be too disparaging toward them, but I'd be interested to know the facts of the matter if maybe those employees being allocated toward their own studio was an intentional move by the higher ups of DMA to offload some of their less talented or less experienced staff to make the transition to Rockstar smoother. Anywho, let's discuss the game itself. Let's start with the visuals. These character models are vague, blurry, and subpar even for the time, but even worse are the animations. The number of frames in each animation, whether it be the walk up, pitch, run, all of them look terrible. Whether it be the frame rate or the possibility that the developers really only created so few frames for each animation, either way is below average by all means, even if it was just shy of two years into the N64 life cycle. The various ballparks and domes and stadiums aren't awful by any means, these aren't really any sport games in 1998 that were doing a great job of detailed venues at this point, and that's just a fact of the matter for the time. Obviously Triple Play, All-Star 98, 99, Ken Griffey, and so on do better jobs here, but I don't think Strike Zone necessarily fails in this area compared to the standards of the times. The overall gameplay is where Strike Zone really does fail though. I would say the gameplay wouldn't be so bad if animations and or frame rate were better, so I guess take that into context for what it's worth, but the gameplay is still subpar by any means. Both games share the absence of a visual Strike Zone, but Strike Zone has a somewhat helpful attempt to mitigate its abysmal frame rate. If any sports game would be affected by frame rate issues, it would be baseball, right? 
pitch isn't 90 miles an hour, get to the plate in roughly four tenths of a second. So if this game runs at 15 frames a second, I would say it probably dips to 12 or less when the pitch happens. So you're looking at roughly five frames as the ball travels from pitcher to home plate. So how Strike Zone tries to make up for this is any pitch is immediately highlighted as blue or red if it's a ball or strike respectively. But that does not 100% guarantee where the ball will end up as the pitcher gets tired seemingly only after two innings and pitches go absolutely wild. At one point I beat four batters in a row in the second inning simply by choosing a fastball and not touching the analog stick. So I guess my point is, if it's red, hit A and hope for the best. Now if you do get a hit, you may not realize it at first, because the game acknowledges that you hit A to swing and got a hit way before the batter actually swings the bat. You'll see the contrail of the ball, and the ball goes sailing as if it were hit, then the swing of the bat a good half second later. This also applies when the CPU is at bat. The most glaring example of this is Home Run Derby. There's only so many ways I can say it, but it just looks bad. The next critique of the gameplay does technically apply to both games, but it's of course worse for Strike Zone. The frame rate absolutely tanks when there's a hit. I don't have the technology to correctly decipher it, but it feels like we get into or come significantly close to single digit frame rates, whereas Triple Play's main issue is catching up with where the ball is going to land and gets back up to speed after a second or two. Strike Zone stutters until the ball is back with the pitcher entirely. Next up is the game does not always allocate your control to the correct player after a hit. I had hits to far left field and the game put me in control of center field, so while I impossibly try to run it down, the CPU left fielder just stands there. Then I also had issues with standing in the catch reticle with the ball falling short. Like the game doesn't even know where the ball is actually going to land or the fielder doesn't automatically catch it. In All-Star and so on, if you were within the catch reticle, the fielder may slightly bend or step to make the catch, but as long as you were within the target, it was going to happen. Here, if you aren't 100% spot on, your player just lets it hit the ground, and needless to say, it's incredibly frustrating. Last but not least of the gameplay is probably something you vividly remember if you played this game before. The home run distances are absolutely absurd. The longest home run distance confirmed in an MLB or AAA game was a 500 footer by Joey Meyer of the Denver Zephyrs in 1987. Now, I'm no physics genius, but the thin air at Mile High Stadium probably helped contribute to this distance. There are claims of Mickey Mantle hitting home runs with distances of 656 and 734 feet, but come on. Anywho, you or more likely your opponent will regularly be hitting home runs of over 800 feet or foul balls so high that they take 7, 8, or even 9 seconds to hit the ground. The context being your typical fly ball is up in the air anywhere from 3 to 5 seconds before it hits the ground or gets caught. Even the bombastic MLB Slugfest didn't even have home run distances like this. Last and possibly least of the game overall though is the audio. Everything sounds like it's coming from a speaker with a pillow laid on top of it and then being channeled in through a phone laid next to the pillow. From hits to catches to the voiceover, it's all very muffled and incredibly poor quality. The spliced voice clips when calling a play mixed with the players' names is very choppy, which, you know, again, a lot of sports games for the time had that, but again, Strike Zone just does it worse. Overall, there's not much else to say here. Like I said earlier, Mike Piazza's strike zone is a bad N64 game and an even worse baseball game. The time will tell throughout this tournament, but I find it hard to believe I'll play a worse baseball game on the 64 than this. Triple Play 2000, of course, takes the win here, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it as a must-play. It's definitely not a bad game per se and will scratch the retro baseball itch if you have one, but there are multiple games out there from the All-Star and Ken Griffey series that I would recommend over this. Thanks again for watching this first wildcard matchup of the Great N64 Showdown. We will be going through lots of sports games for the next several episodes, so hopefully that's your thing. If not, please still tune in for the sake of keeping up with how future matchups are lining up, as once we get out of the wildcard, these genres will start mixing up a bit here. Just to recap what we've done so far, we started a little bit out of order by skipping the wildcard round, and we had Super Mario 64 winning the first round matchup against Superman, the new Superman Adventures, or more commonly known as Superman 64. And Super Mario 64 will face the winner of the round one matchup, Powerpuff Girls, Chemical Extraction, and Triple Play 2000. However, that will be quite some time from now as we mow through the wildcard round our next wildcard matchup will be Mia Ham Soccer versus World Cup 98. 
Thanks so much again for watching. Please stay tuned here for a quick little channel update. Hey everyone, I just wanted to give a quick update and apologize for the delay in videos. It took a little over a month to do the next matchup and it's arguably for far less interesting games with far less to discuss, but I've been under the weather quite a bit lately and you know, being a father of four and working full time, there's just, there's only so many, any days in the week to be able to accomplish all this. So. I did, however, upgrade my video capture device, um, not necessarily with these two games, as again, I recorded this gameplay roughly a month ago, but I actually got an N64 uh, to HDMI output and then an HDMI capture device uh, to use moving forward. Previously, I've been using an Elgato simple RGB capture, which is a very nice cheap option, but there have been some significant audio delays that I've noticed from gameplay videos that I've been recording, so I figured it was time to, you know, save myself some headache and invest in a, you know, albeit more expensive but more reliable option. The next thing I wanted to talk about was the Better Horizons Plays channel. Um, you may have noticed some of the previous Let's Play videos got taken down. As I'm newer to YouTube, trying to figure out how to harness the YouTube algorithm a little more, and then, you know, found out from, you know, looking at some channels that I've watched over the years, you know, figuring out why they split out their Let's Plays into other videos, as obviously simple Let's Plays are going to get lower views and so on in those and those hurt the algorithm's likelihood to show your channels. It thinks your videos are underperforming. So um, I did start a second channel, simply Better Horizons Plays, and I'm working on re-uploading some of those um, older Let's Plays, but um, I did keep some of the more interesting ones, like some of the ROM hacks on this channel for now, but slowly but surely I'll get everything moved over there and re-uploaded. Um, at the moment, I'm playing through Quake 64. It's been an interesting, fun time. On the harder difficulties it's a lot a lot more difficult than i remember but um but if that's your thing i highly recommend checking it out taking a look like i said i'll be uploading you know some older stuff and some even some new games uh moving forward so you know please give it a look you know like and subscribe there as well um maybe someday soon we'll start doing some live streams you know as i play through some of these more important n64 games you know obviously thinking of things like Zelda and games that are longer in general will probably try to start doing some live streams so um, you know if you want to be notified of when those are happening you know by all means like I said just like and subscribe on the Better Horizons Plays channel and we'll see you there.